What if? 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 We're doing this series called If. So who's ready for this? If. And, and many times we have ifs in our, well, if this would have happened, then I would have had this. Or if this, then this. There are over, uh, are over 2,000 ifs in the Bible when you start studying it. This is one of the, um, really one of the strongest ones that are in the Bible. You won't want to miss next week. I'm actually, I was preaching uh, first service and I got, well, in the middle of preaching, the Lord just starts speaking to me. Uh, about next week's sermon. I'm like, can I finish this one before you tell me next week? And so next week, you won't want to miss next week because he told me what it was before I even finished this one. If, and this one of the biggest ifs and one of the ones I was hoping to skip over, but it's 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Who wants revival in our country? We don't see want a move of God. We want God to do something big in our country. Who, and if we want God to move in a big way, uh, this is a key scripture that shows us how we have a move of God I don't know if you know this, it is election year, so there's a lot of strife in our country, <laughs> a lot of strife in our country anyway, and, and we look for politics to, to solve the problem. Now, I want to say this, I believe we should stand up for what is biblically true and right. I believe in that, but I don't believe the government is what brings revival. As a matter of fact, I know the government is not what brings revival. As a matter of fact, we see it here. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, if my people, if my people who are called by my name. What happens if my people who are called by my name, where does revival start? See, we think revival starts outside. Revival doesn't start outside. Revival starts right here. How, does, how are we going to have revival in our country, in our world? How do we have that? We have revival in us. Anybody out there at all? I mean, you got, you got to get more excited. If you want, who wants revival in your own life? Okay, who wants revival in our country? Who wants a move of God? In our, then you got to, it starts with us. See, we expect it to be something exterior, like, oh, God will do this, and then we'll see this, and it'll be amazing. Even if you look at the last great revival we had in our history, really was, was probably the Jesus movement in the, the early 70s, late 60s, which was a movement where God really used people who most people wouldn't have chosen. He used this hippie generation, but where did it start? It started within a church. The church was praying and seeking God and going after God, and God started revival. It didn't look like, it didn't look like what everybody expected it to do, so I just wanted you to be ready. It's probably not going to look like what you always expect it to be, but God says this. Here's what, here's what starts it. If my people who are called by my name, what does that even goes deeper right there? If my people who are family, everybody get this. If you got my name, you are my family. If my people who are called by my name, that's, that's where revival starts. Everybody get this. Revival starts in us. Revival starts in the church. And, and revival starts w with God moving in us. God, do something in our country. And God's like, I want to do something in you. Let me do something in you, and then it will spread. And we'll, we'll get into this. If my people who are called by my name will do what? Will humble themselves. We're going to pause right there. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves. Humble themselves. What does that even mean to humble ourselves? Uh, I think about this. John the Baptist, when Jesus was coming, you know, he said this incredible statement. He said, he said, I must decrease so he can increase. Talking about Jesus. There must be less of me about the situation and more of him. I want to say this. When it comes to being humble, it's not thinking less about yourself. It's not like you're nothing or you're not valuable. Being humble is not thinking less uh, about who you are. Being humble is thinking less of yourself about who you are. See, we don't think I'm less, but I think about myself less. What do I mean by that? I don't think I'm less of a person, but I think more about God than I do about myself. I think more about others than I do about myself. It's not all about me, but we live in a world where it's all about us. We live in a very I-centered world where everything's all about me. And you see that in the church also. You see that in the church. And I, I remember when I first started going to church and stuff, I saw that among people, religious people, who everything was all about them. That's not the way God wants it. What do we do? We humble ourselves. It says, if my people who are called by my, my name will humble themselves. What does that word humble even mean? 
Do you know what it literally means? The literal translation in Hebrew means this. To humble myself, it means to bow down. It means to get down. It means I will humble myself. I will bow down. As a matter of fact, you would see this all throughout Scripture, that when God would show up, what would they do? They would bow down. You even see it in the book of Revelations. When God shows up, they cast their crowns which is being humble, anybody out there, and they bow down in his presence, that we are called to be humble. We are not called to be all about ourselves. But you can be on your knees, and if your heart is not humbled, it does no good. We are called to live humble lives. What does that mean? Less of us and more of him. Less of us and more of others. Anybody else struggle with this whole humble thing? (laughs) Okay, I'm the only one. A few of you struggle with it. It's, I, I, I can struggle with this sometimes. And we live in a culture where, well, I didn't get enough likes on this or not enough people recognize me in this. And, and we want the recognition from all these people around us. And here's what I would say. What if we're not recognized by anyone except God? Amen. Can I just share with you, that's not a bad place to be at all. <laughs> that is actually a great and a blessed place to be. But we are called to live humble lives. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says this. It says, all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Okay? I, I like in Scripture, it says this. It says to clothe yourself in different verses. And, and one, it says to put on. What is that? It's a decision that we make. Okay, all of you are dressed. Thank God. Everyone is dressed today. Everyone has clothes on. I'm so glad about that. Um, But when you got dressed this morning, you had to make a decision and go through the effort to put clothes on. Who's with me? It's the same thing with humility. We're not just automatically humble. Woo! No one noticed that, so it's okay. (laughs) No, we want people to notice, but what do we do? We put on, we clothe ourselves with humility. I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose not to worry about what everybody else thinks. I'm going to choose to live for an audience of one. That's where I'm going to live. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another because look at this. God opposes the proud. Another verse says, God resists the proud. He's like, no, prideful people, no, 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 uh uh-uh, no, no. I want humble people. Think Think about God himself. What did Jesus do? He came in the form of a man. Did he live in the nicest house? No, he didn't even have a place to live. He traveled around and stayed in other people's houses. Did he have all the nicest things? No. Do you know what? He was humble. He sets the example of how our life should be. It says, God opposes the proud, but what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. He gives strength to the humble. It says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that what will happen? That he may lift you up in due time. That when we live a life where we are humble, we live a life where like, God, no, it's not about me. It's about you. God, no, it's not about me. It's about you. God, help me to help others. And and if no one notices it, I don't care. Everybody out there, we want the the recognition because we want people to know. We want to be up there. What if we live a humble life? Then it says this, an amazing verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. After it talks about living this humbled life, a humbled life where, where it's not all about us, he says, then cast all your cares on me. Cast your anxiety on me because I care for you. Cast all your anxiety, all your worry, all your cares on me. When we humble ourselves and we put him above us, he will take care of every problem we have. Everybody grab that. When we humble ourselves, God, I need you more than I need myself. God, I can't take care of this right now, but I know you can help me and you can do this. When we humble ourselves, all of our anxiety and care goes off of us and goes to him. How, if we want a revival in our life, what do we have to say? God, I'm going to humble myself. He says, if my people call by my name, we'll do what? We'll humble themselves. Then it says this, and pray. I'm not going to talk a long time about this one because it's pretty clear. But what if we just spent time talking to God? What if we just spent time in his presence? What if we just spent time being close to him? What if we would humble ourselves and say, you know, one of the reasons why we don't pray is because we're not humble. But, but when we get this place of humility, I realize that's where I need to go to get my help. Amen. I can't do this on my own. I need to go to him to get my help. And so I go to him and I pray. And, and here's what I want to say to everybody in this room. You don't have to pray fancy words to impress God. Your fancy words don't impress God because God sees past the fancy and he sees your heart. Amen. It says, what if you pray? What if you pray? Look here. In in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Because look, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. When we get to that place where where we humble ourselves and we're talking to him, we become power and effective. It comes to us. That's where our prayers are. Our prayers make a difference. 
So he says, come humble yourselves and pray. And then do what? And seek my face. And seek my face. Everybody get this. And seek my face. And want to and be close to me. And hunger and long to be near me. Okay, if I came in today and I said this, and you never know with me, I could do it. But if I came in today and I said, underneath one of your chairs, we have hidden $1,000. Who would jump up and look under every chair to find that $1,000? Who would do that? Raise your hand. I would do it. How many of you would, I mean, you would, how many of you push people out of the way and you would do anything it took and then and, and we're closing the doors. You're like, I'm not done looking. You would, you would go to extreme measures to get that $1,000. Here's what I would say. Okay, if we would seek $1,000, how many know we should seek God even more? We should be like, God, I, I, want, I, want, I want to be close to you. I want to be near you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. But he gives us, I'm going to do whatever it takes. But you don't understand my schedule. What if your schedule didn't matter as much as his presence? What if your schedule didn't matter as much as revival? Anybody out there? What if your schedule doesn't matter as much as your family being touched and changed? What if your schedule did, but I have these other things. What if we prioritize? Number one thing in my life is to seek his face. Number one thing in my life I want is I want him. Uh -huh. If those people who are called by my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek and seek and go after and look for my face. Yeah. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said this. He said, seek the kingdom of God of what? Above all else. He didn't say go and sit your butt in a chair on Sunday mornings. He said, seek me above everything else. Sunday morning is not the only time. That should be something we do our, in our life every single day. God, I want to seek you. What if we got up and we said, how do I seek him? What if, we, what if we set our alarm early and got up early and spent time with him? Who believes he could reward that and give you more strength and more energy throughout that day? What if you turned off the TV and said, no, I'm not going to watch this. I'm going to seek you. And we make a decision, I'm going to seek. I'm going to seek his face more than anything else. Who wants revival in your life? Revival won't come by you sitting and doing nothing. Revival comes by what? If my people, my family who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and go toward me and run toward me and not stop. Everybody get this. And not stop. If they seek my face and run after him, Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. What if when we're worshiping on Sunday morning, if we strove toward his presence and we said, God, I want you more than I want anything. What if instead of it being about us and I don't like that song or I don't do this or, you know, during worship, I just don't, I don't do. What if we say, no, I'm setting me aside and humbling myself and I'm going to do what you say, God. There's a song I learned a long time ago. It's weird, and I still remember this song. I don't know if anybody else in this room will know it because I, I learned it when I was, I was going to Bible school, and, and I was helping in the youth group at this church and at the Bible school that I went to, and, and the youth group had this, this song that they did. They would do it almost every week, and it just got embedded in my heart. And it was a song they sang, and, and the lyrics were really simple. The lyrics went like this, Lord, I want to know you. In my heart there is a fire. Every morning when I wake up, it's you that I desire. Just to feel your heartbeat is what I long for. Oh, Lord, I want to know you more. One of the things that I love to do is I, when I get up in the morning and I'm, maybe I'm driving to work or I'm just spending time with God, I will sing this song over and over and over again. And with anyone else in the car, I'll just, I'll just sit there. And that song has resonated in my heart over the years. And I'll just say to God, Lord, I want to know you. In my heart there is a fire. Every morning when I wake up, it's you that I desire. Just to feel your heartbeat is what I long for, oh Lord, I want to know you more. And I will sing that song every day, and I know I'm not the greatest singer, <laughs> and I really don't care. 
But what if that is the cry of our heart? What if, God, I want you more than anything else? Who thinks revival will come in your life? In our world. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, they'll want to know me. They'll want to be close to me. See, some of you are running on no power. And the reason you're running on no power is because you're not close to him. Some of you aren't hearing his voice. You don't know what to do. And the reason is because you're not seeking him and you're not close to him. You know, we live on a, we, in our house, we still we have a bunch of trees in our backyard. I've cut down so many trees. I've cut down probably 40 trees, little trees, big, all these trees in my backyard. I've cut them down, but we still have a bunch of trees in our backyard, and we have a ton of leaves. You know, in the fall, what does it do? All the leaves fall to the ground. And I don't hire somebody to come rake my leaves because I got kids in my house who have to eat, and they need to earn their food. And, and so... And so I'll take him out, and I'm like, we're going to rake some leaves. But I get to run. I get to run the leaf blower. I like that. And so I have this leaf blower, and I'll go out there, I'll blow the leaves. Like, Dad, can we use a leaf blower? No, it's my leaf blower. This is the fun part of the job. You know, putting it in the bags is not fun. This is the fun. I'll blow on them every once in a while, and then I'll do it. But then something happens at some point, because we have so many leaves, at some point, the battery goes dead. And so what do I do when the battery goes dead? I take the battery off. And I take it in the house, and I hook it up to the charger. And it gets full again. That's where we need to go. Amen. God, I want to be full again. Who can go to work and deal with people and you get empty? Go and get full again and seek his face. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Here's the fun one. Everybody ready for the fun one? And turn from their wicked ways. And turn from their wicked ways. And turn from their wicked ways. That word ways, I studied it. It literally means a path. Do you know what we do? We get in this cycle of going down these wicked paths. We go to these paths in our life, and they lead us to destruction. We go to these paths in our life that lead us far from God. And we have these paths in our life. And what does the Bible say to do? The word repent literally doesn't mean to, you don't fall on your face and cry. It literally means this. It means you make a decision to turn. I'm going this way. I'm going to repent. What does that mean? It means turn around and go the other way. It means I'm choosing this path. Here's my path I'm choosing. I'll give you some paths out there. Some of you choose the path of, of fear and worry, and you choose this path, and you walk down this path, and you've done it for years. I'm just going to worry. I'm going to fear. What if you say, you know what? I'm not going to be on that path anymore. I'm going to change paths. That's not going to be on my, I'm not going to go down. What if I go down this path, which is to trust God with all my heart? I'm going to change my path and turn from my wicked ways. That's literally what it means. I'm going to change paths. Some of you are on the path of addiction. Where alcohol, drugs, different things. Some of you are addicted to video games. And this addiction cycle just goes. And you're like, well, video games aren't a bad thing to be addicted to. If you put them before God, they are. Amen. Everybody get that? So you're on this path of, I do this, I do this, I do this. What if we choose an, another path and say, I'm not going down that path any longer? Here's what I would say. Pray for God to show you the wrong paths you're on. And for him to show you the path to change to. Here's what you do. You don't just say, I'm not going down that path anymore and sit down. No, because that path will keep calling your name. What do you do? Go down another path. Change your direction. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, choose a different path. Choose a different. First Corinthians, actually 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, it says, I'm sorry. The apostle Paul telling the, the church in Corinth this. He goes, I'm sorry I sent you those letters. I'm not sorry, actually. I'm not sorry I sent you the, the severe letter to you. What did he do? He wrote a letter and he chewed them out. <laughs> he said, you're going the wrong direction. You're doing the wrong things. And he wrote him this letter. I'm not sorry I sent you that severe letter, although I was sorry at first. For now I know it was painful for you for a little while. But now I'm glad that I sent it to you. Not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and to change your ways, to change your path. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants for his people to have. And so you were not harmed by us in any way for the sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Crying tears doesn't change anything. Crying tears and getting on a different path changes everything. 
What are the paths you need to change? Some of them, maybe they're small paths. Some, everybody grab this. Maybe some of the paths that you have in your life have been there in your life, in your family's life. It's been a generational path. Guess what God can do? He can break those generational paths. And he can get you down the path that he wants you to go. But it takes some effort to say, I'm not going near that path again. What if we do that? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith, face and change their path and turn, and turn from their wicked ways, then what will happen? Aren't you glad there's a then? He doesn't just say do this. He goes, when you do this, then this is what will happen. Then, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven. Then heaven's going to be open. Anybody, anybody out there with me? There's a, one of the greatest places, one of the greatest churches in the country is, is a church in South Korea, and it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people. And you know what the pastor prays there all the time? He prays for an open heaven. He prays for God to move in there to be an open heaven. What if we get to this place where we, where we humble ourselves, and then heaven is open, and what happens? Every prayer that we pray is heard, and God moves in a big and amazing way. Who wants your prayers to be heard and to make a difference? What do we have to do? We have to change our direction. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will. Okay, you're like, well, I've been praying. I haven't been getting it. Here's what I would say. The proud pray, I want what I want. What do the humble pray? I want what you want. The proud say, give me this, Lord. That's what I want. And the humble says, Lord, I, I want that. And here's the thing. Think about Jesus. How did he pray? He says, Lord, if it's your will, I'd rather not go through this. But whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Yes. It's okay to pray what you want in your heart. God, if it's, if it's your will, I would like that. If it's your will, I want that to happen. But you know what? It's not what I want. I mean, that's a humble life. What I want is not the most important thing. Some of you have quit following God or backed away because he didn't give you what you want. But here's the problem. What you want was taking you down a sucky path. And if he had gave you what you wanted, he would have helped destroy your life. And he goes, no, I'm not giving you that. What if we pray, God, it's not what I want, but what you want is the most important. And if we pray those prayers that are his will, what happens? This is if we ask anything according to his will, what does he do? He hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So what if we change our prayers from it's not about what I want, God, but it's about what you want. And we humble ourselves and we pray and watch God move in a big way. He will hear from heaven. Here's the next one. He will forgive their sin. You know what, you know what that is? That's restoration. <laughs> See, God isn't, God isn't about keeping us at a distance. God wants restoration in our relationship with him. God is a God of restoration. And it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, what happens? He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all wickedness. What happens if we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek his face and we turn from our wicked ways? He hears from heaven. Then what? He forgives our sins. They're all washed away. And what does he do? He builds it back. He builds restoration. So we're like, well, God could never do anything in me. There could never be a move of God through me. God could never use me. Now let me say this. We're talking about revival. Revival starts right here. But what does it do? It doesn't stay right here. Anybody with me? Revival starts right here, but it doesn't stay right here. Mm -hmm. Revival starts right here, and it goes into the whole world and changes the world. Amen. So what are we called to do? We pray, and, and, and we receive his healing and his restoration. His restoration comes into our life, so we can go and do what? So we can get others to be restored. Exactly. He will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin. And then look, look at the last one. He will heal their land. Who thinks our land needs healing? <laughs> Who thinks our, our church needs a revival? Who thinks our city needs a revival? Who thinks our state needs a revival? Who thinks our country, who thinks our world needs a move of God? He will heal our land. I want to read a verse to you, and I want you to grab hold of this. We're almost done. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says this, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Was it? He says this, repent, like we just talked about. And then what will happen? Times of refreshing will come from the Lord. Do you know what that word refreshing means? 
you look up the definition of it, it means revival. Who wants revival again? It's time for times of revival. Where does revival start? It starts in us. It starts with this move of God that's in us, and then it goes beyond us and touches the entire world. God wants revival, but he wants it to start in us. I want to read a few more verses to you. They're not in your notes, but I want to read them to you. I want to set the, you know, kind of set the scene for at the end. We're going to say what was even 2 Corinthians 7, 14. Where did that even come from? Well, if you look at the verses before it, what was happening was Solomon had the temple built. And literally there were thousands of people working thousands of hours to build this temple. And so they had this temple built where it was just amazing and it was beautiful. It was exactly the specifications that God asked for. And he had this temple built. And look in verse 1, I'll read it to you. It says, Solomon finished praying. He was praying for the temple. He was dedicating it to the Lord. And Solomon finished praying and fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Everybody get this. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the temple because the glory of the Lord had filled it. So they're there and they prepared this temple and Solomon prays a prayer where they're offering sacrifices and, and fire falls and the presence of God fills that place so much they couldn't even walk in. I mean, his presence was there so strong that they would get close and they would fall on their face because his presence was that strong in the temple. Guess where the temple is today? Everybody get this. This is not the temple. Everybody got this. This is not the temple. This is an old movie theater. This is not the temple. Now we meet here and we worship God here, but this is not the temple. This is not the temple. Where is the temple? Here is the temple. Woo! We are the temple. We are the temple. The Bible says we're the temple of who? The Holy Spirit. The building is not the temple. There's nothing holy or sacred about this building. We are the temple. Who wants the glory of God to fill the temple? Who wants his presence to fill the temple? Who wants people to see the fire in your life in the temple? Who wants, see, I'm not interested in going to church. I'm interested in having revival, having fire. I'm not interested in saying I'm a Christian. I want to live it out so much that people can see the glory of God in my life. They can see the fire. They can see everything that is him. That's where we're supposed to be. Let's go ahead and keep reading. It says, and the priest could not enter the temple because the glory of the Lord filled it. And all the Israelites saw the fire coming down. What happened? The people who weren't in the temple saw the fire from the outside. The, the fire that's in you, the revival that's supposed to be in you, is not just for you. It's supposed to be seen by all those around. It says this, when the Israelites saw the fire coming down, the glory of God around the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and they gave thanks to God saying, he is good. His love endures forever. And then the king and all the people sacrificed, offered their sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice, listen to this, of 22,000 herd of cattle and 120,000 sheep of goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple to God. What did they do? They brought their sacrifice to him and they didn't bring the leftovers. Everybody get this. They brought their best. They didn't bring the leftovers. They brought their best. Why? Because the glory was there. Because God's presence. Who wants that in your life? Who wants revival in your life? Who wants the presence of God in your life so much? The whole world can see it. That people walking by say, Whoa, there's something going on in that guy's life. There's something happening in that lady's life. Because it's not you. It's the glory of God in the temple. Because that's where revival starts. Who wants that in your life? Jump up on your feet right now. Let's worship God. Come on, let's lift our hands and sing this together. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all. We surrender, surrendering all. Lord, find me here. Desperate for you. Well, see that chorus. I surrender. I surrender. 
say this, in order to have a move of God in your life, there has to be surrender. God, I need you more than I need me. God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. God, I surrender. God, I make a decision to change and to let go of of what shouldn't be in my life and to grab hold of what should, which is you. I surrender. And if you are here today and you haven't surrendered, you will never live the life you were called to live. You will never fulfill your purpose. You'll go through and you might survive and everybody else might think everything's good or they might think it's a train wreck. Doesn't matter either way. If you don't have Him and live a surrendered life to Him, your life will always feel empty. But when you surrender to Him, greatness will come alive inside of you like you never experienced before. Maybe you're here today and you've never followed him, you've never surrendered to Christ. Maybe you have, but, but you've kind of let go and you've grabbed hold of other things and they're ahead of him. Today, what if, we, what if we humble ourselves and say, God, I need you more than I need anything. God, move in my life in a big and amazing way all across the room. If you're here today and you say, Tom, my heart, my life is not right with God, but I want it to be and I need it to be. Pray for me. Pray with me. I want to pray for you right now. How many of that's you right now? You say, Tom, my life isn't right. My heart's not right, but I want it to be and I need it to be. Pray for me. If that's you right now, lift up your hands all around the room and say, my heart's not lying. All right, my life's not. Lift them up as you go. God bless you all around them over here. God bless you right there. God bless you. Yes, God bless you right over there. Anybody else right here? My life isn't right. God bless you, ma'am, sir. God bless you and you and all around the room. Hands are everywhere. But today I make a decision to surrender because I need more than me. And I need God's help. Anybody else? You said, that's me. My life, my heart's not right. But I want it to be. Pray for me. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Let's all pray together. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father. Let's have everybody in the room. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father. I surrender. I want you. And I need you. And I ask you. To move in my life Jesus thank you for dying for me 
And right now, I surrender to you. My heart, my life, my everything, I surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say this now, okay? As, as a church, I don't, I don't just want to come on Sunday and have church. Anybody with me? I want us to have a move of God. Anybody out there? And a move of God that doesn't start on Sunday morning and end right after church, but a move of God that continues to go. But here's what I'll say. We can't stay where we're at and get to that place. We have to make a decision. I'm going to move to where you are to get to that place. You had something in? Grab your mic real quick. This is my wife, Kim. She has something God laid on her heart. Mic's not on. <laughs> you get close to me. You can whisper in my ear. There we go. There you go. There's a mic now. Okay. Just talk loud. Okay. Um, we were just down here, and, and I didn't know my husband was giving the altar call right here um, at the end. But I just went to him and I said, you know, where is that verse? The verse, the, the one you read at the end. No. Repent. No. Yeah, it is. Acts 3.19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, we can say all day long, oh, I'm, you know, I'm his temple. I want the glory. I want the glory. But what's, what's the key? It's repenting and, and turning. Like, go this way. We're going this way. We turn around and go that way. And, you know, I, I want revival. But, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're saved. You know you're saved. You know I'm saved. And, you know, he just gave the altar call. So anyone here who's not had the chance to get their right life, life right with God has given their life, gotten the chance to get their life right. Maybe it's not some glaring sin. But maybe there's some things that, you know, the Lord has been convicting you of that you need to repent from. You know, and I'm not, I'm not sitting here pointing a finger. I'm just saying I'd like to take just an opportunity just to, to seek the Lord and ask, you know, God, God, is there anything in my life that, you know, that, that, that you want me to change? Maybe, maybe it's something he wants you to put in your life. And if there's nothing that, you know, that God has revealed to us or revealed to you, then here's what I would say, you know, to intercede on behalf of our country. Like just to take a few minutes just to pray and cry out to God for the wickedness that, that is going on in our country, you know, like kind of like an intercessory prayer, you know, God says to, to, to humble ourselves and to pray, to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. We need to be praying for our country. So, I mean, if we want to see revival in our land, then we have to turn. That's the first key is repent, to turn. So I just, I don't know, I just, it was just on my heart to pray for that. To, you know, first of all, look inside. God, is there anything in my life that I need to repent from, you know? Some, some little thing that it's, it's not, you're not calling, you're calling me to do differently. And then after that, just to pray for our nations, to pray for our country, you know, for the wickedness that is, that is rampant across our land. I mean, I, I think of abortion, how it's, how we're, we're killing young babies, you know, that's one thing that I really, really think of how that's, that's, that's sin. And we're, I don't know, it's wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. You know, when you go in and, and you read the Bible and how God formed us and knew us from the womb, He determined all of our days, and, and, and children are being murdered and slaughtered in our land freely. So to see those things change, to, to cry out to God for those type of things. And to cry out for God, to, what path do we need to change? Who has a path in your life you need to change? God, help us. God, help us to see that path. God, to go down the other path. God, the path of your joy and of your peace, the path of your correction to have us not live the life that we've been living. All of us have things in our life. Your word says, search me and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And God, help us to turn from that and turn to you. God, help us to repent and then your presence comes. God, we're not perfect and I think that's why Jesus died. But when we ask you, we repent, you help us to get back on the right path. Lord, I pray that you would show us and help us to do that. Here's what else I want to do. Who wants to move to that place of revival in your life? And I would say that it doesn't happen by you staying where you're at. It helps by you going to another place. Who wants a move of God in your life? Who wants, a, who wants God to do something big and amazing in your life right now all around the room? I want you to move from where you're at, those who want to, and come down to the front. Uh, we're not going to pray for you. We're not going to lay hands on you. We just want to worship for a second and say, I want to go from this place of, of where I'm at to a new place. I want to be in your presence. 
God, I want to be close to you. God, I want you to move in my life in a big and a big and a big and amazing way. In a big and amazing way. I think this needs to be like a time of just introspection and, and intercession. Not like a, you know what I'm saying? Not like something really big and loud. Just get, to get quiet before him. And as the band worships and sings, you know. Seek our face. Yeah. God, we ask you yes. to show us. Show us what needs to change. Everybody just lift up your hands toward heaven. Let's listen for his voice. desires, God. We seek you first in your kingdom, Lord. We seek you first. God, change our hearts, soften our hearts, and lead us the way we should go. You go before us, Lord, and you make our crooked path straight. God, we will follow you where you lead. Spirit, lead me where my trust without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you call me. Take me deep my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Yeah. 
than just to feel your heartbeat is what I long for. Oh, Lord, I want to know you more. Our heart cry. God, let that be our heart cry. God, let that be our heart cry to want you more than anything. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven. Then, then. Lord, we, we cry out, Father. We cry out for our state, for the city. Lord, we pray and we cry out to you, hear us, oh God. We thank you that your word says that as we pray, Lord, you begin to listen and you send the answer. Even before the, yes. all the words leave our lips, Father, you send the answer. And we cry out and we repent on behalf of, of our nation, Father. We cry out and we ask you for to forgive us for the wickedness that has gone on, Father. Just all the things that are wrong that aren't, aren't right, Father. We, we ask you to forgive us, Move back into oceans. We, we humble ourselves, we humble our hearts, and we cry out and we intercede on behalf of our nation, of this people, of these of these wrongs that have gone on, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, on behalf of our nation. Forgive us, Father. We want to see things put right. We want your kingdom come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. Use us, God. Let revival begin in us. Let it begin in us, Father. The, the things that are wrong in our lives, Father, we repent and we turn and we go towards you, Father. The things that are... The little things, God, the big things, God, we ask you to move and we repent and we, we say we're not going this way anymore. We're turning around. Father, show us how we can make a difference in this nation. Father, I know it begins in our lives, Father, but we, we need to stand up for righteousness. Show us the change, the specific changes that we can make to make a difference. Sometimes it seems overwhelming how one person can make a change, God. It's not too hard for you. Yes. It's not too hard for you. If you speak to each one of us the different things that we can do to make changes in our world, I, I just ask you to reveal it to us. Open the eyes of our understanding that we may know the hope to which we've been called, the glorious inheritance in the saints, Father. Father, I pray that we would understand and know and see your love and how we would grasp how wide and how deep, how high and how broad your love is for us. God, I thank you. I thank you for, for using us, God. We surrender our lives to you. Use us as your vessels, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord.
place I would rather be. Come on, let your voice. No place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. Place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. So that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Here's what we're going to do. We're not going to end service. We're going to keep it going everywhere you go. So your heart's going to be open. Who can have that? God, show me. Search me and know me. Anything he shows you, what do we do? We repent. We turn from it. We go to him. We get in his presence. Who's ready for times of refreshing? But we have to make a decision. Things in me that shouldn't be there, I'm going to get rid of them. Things that, say, different paths I need to go, I'm going to do it. Who wants revival in your life, in your family, in our country, Lord? We just say, here we are moving our lives in a big and amazing way as we seek you and as we go after you as we change our paths and we want your face in Jesus name amen have an incredible day